Good evening, everybody. I am delighted to host um, what we used to call a no free lunch seminar, but as the pandemic changed our format from catered in person luncheons at the business school in a classroom to a virtual evening format that we've opened up to a much broader audience. Um, so everyone here tonight, if you want to know a little bit about your colleagues um, who are attending as well, a lot of you are Columbia Business School alumni, some of you are students. MBAs, masters, and PhD. And a lot of you are also just from the general business and finance practitioner community who have been involved with the program for financial studies and Columbia Business School in the past. And my name is Melina Denebaim. I co-direct the program for financial studies, as well as the master of science and financial economics degree program at the business school. But I am delighted and honored to host uh, two extraordinary professors who have really set the stage with groundbreaking research in different areas of finance. And uh, I have Wei, Professor Wei Zhang and Professor Laura Veldkamp, who will both be speaking tonight in approximately a 20 minute format, uh, distilling the current research project into a manner in which all of you can follow and be interested in and connect with. And um, I'm just going to pull up their bios um, to give you a little bit of a flavor of their backgrounds. But first, I will let you know that Wei Zhang will be presenting, uh, will be our first presenter. And she will be presenting uh, her talk on how to talk when a machine is listening. So Wei, you have captured my attention on this one. I am more than curious about your research. And Laura Veldkamp will then follow uh, with her presentation and research on the changing economics of knowledge production, which again, I'm, I, I haven't been this excited um, or this intrigued by the titles in a while, so I like it. And I'm going to introduce um, both of you to the audience. By the way, if you have questions, audience members, you're welcome to put them into the chat, or, I'm sorry, the Q&A, and I will look at fielding the questions um, for the presenters. But I'd like to, have the opportunity uh, just to give you a little bit of background. So Wei Zheng is the Arthur F. Burns Professor of Free and Competitive Enterprise in the Finance Division at CBS. She's also a scholar in residence at Columbia Law School, a senior fellow at the Program on Corporate Governance at Harvard Law and a research associate of uh, NBER Law and Economics. So let me scroll down a little. Um, she has a very, so Professor Zhang is a leading scholar on corporate governance, and in particular, she has pioneered research in hedge fund activism. She has published, published extensively in economic, economics, finance, and law journals, and she has received many distinguished prizes, been published in many different publications, so I'm not going to go through and name all of them. Um, but she also has served in the role as vice dean for curriculum and instruction at the business school and has taught many courses. So if you're lucky enough to have taken her courses, it could have been in corporate finance, corporate governance, activist investing, empirical methods and finance research, or panel data econometrics um, in all of the masters, MBA, MBA, and PhD programs that she's taught in. And she's received numerous excellence in teaching awards. So as you can see, Wei is a force to be reckoned with, and I have the pleasure of, of knowing her at the business school. And secondly, um, I'm very excited to introduce Laura. And Laura, I think you joined us several years ago. Um, so Laura also is in the finance division. She's the Cooperman Professor of Finance and Economics, and she's the former editor of the Journal of Economic Theory. Um, her background is in applied mathematics and econ and economics, and she has also taught at NYU for 15 years. So Laura came uptown to join us at CBS. We're very thankful for that move, although everybody, New York City, we're all one and in it together. She's also a faculty research fellow for the National Bureau of Economic Research and the Center for Economic and Policy Research. And she's a frequent consultant for the New York and Minneapolis Federal Reserve Banks. She is author of a textbook, Information Choice in Macroeconomics and Finance. Uh, her research focuses on how individuals, investors, and firms get their information and how that information affects the decisions they make and how those decisions affect the macroeconomy and asset prices. Her recent work examines the data economy and the value of data as an asset. 
So with that, I will turn it over to Professor Wei Zheng and uh, who will start her screen sharing. And I'm delighted we have an hour together. Um, and so if you think of questions, put them in the Q&A or you can hold them until after her presentation. Thank you, Melina, uh, for the introduction. So good evening, family and friends of um, Columbia Business School. It's my absolute pleasure uh, to be the showcase of faculty research at Columbia Business School. So um, tonight I'm going to talk about a new paper co-authored with three scholars um, talking about uh, in terms of corporate disclosure, if the managers anticipate that your disclosure could be read or heard, by the machines, how would you dis, uh, how would you change the way that you would communicate yourself? Okay. So we are in 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 this community. So I don't have to spend a lot of time to motivate the critical importance of corporate disclosure. Uh, it communicates the financial health of the firm to promote the brand, promote the culture, as well to uh, engage not just shareholders but a full spectrum of stakeholders. Now, when we think about um, the best uh, corporate American writing, I would, I would say the prize probably will go to Warren Buffett. Now, every year, um, Warren Buffett's annual letter to the shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway uh, is, is a must read. So every year you will get some uh, lifetime wisdoms, for example, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Now we have to decide now whether we are supposed to be fearful or greedy at this moment. Now, when you think about the writing um, uh, by Warren Buffett, um, obviously his team, is that they have a unique audience in mind. And that audience is represented uh, in, this, in this stadium in Omaha. And you're really, really talking to human ears. Now, this uh, situation is changing um, slowly, gradually, but also quite pervasively. Now, this is another uh, indication, and, and here is we're talking about the CEO of Man Group. Now, Man Group is one of the uh, leading um, asset manager or hedge funds with, um, um, in, in globally. And the CEO is talking about when he needs to communicate with the shareholders, he does not only have the human ears in mind because he knows that his voice could be deciphered by AI tools, and a machine. So this is an article uh, uh, published in, in Financial Times a while ago, not because, not that we follow this article by the paper, that article actually was featuring this work, this piece of work. Okay, so let's get down to the business. Suppose I do want to know that how corporate disclosure has been reshaped by um, AI readers or machine readers, what would have happened? Now, to get that research question down to something that's tangible and feasible, the first thing that we have to measure the extent of machine readership. Now, one thing, the first step we have done is simply to measure machine downloads. So we all download, we all download uh, incessantly from, from, from internet all day long. Now, how are we supposed to know whether a certain act of downloads uh, is done by the machine or done by human beings? Now, this, there is a literature in finance accounting that gradually researchers um, uh, decided that certain best practice to make this thing happen. And here's a standard algorithm, which is following a recent paper in 20, 2015. It's basically saying if there's an IP address that downloads more than, uh, more than 50 unique forms of filing, so they can download any number of the filings, but if the filings come from 50 unique firms in a single day, then we call it machine downloads. Because if you think about a human beings, it's very unlikely if you have, even if you work 12, 16 hours a day, it's very difficult to download 50 unique firms, okay? And also during the time of the downloading, um, you also know the, how the software we use, they use as a download. If it involves a web crawler, then it's a machine download. Now the SEC actually keeps such a lot of filing data, but unfortunately the SEC stopped publishing the database in 2017, hence the research for now it's ending in 2016, but we think it's, it's, it's pretty informative, okay? So if you look at the trend, you will see that the number of machine downloads increase steadily over time, 
the percentage of machine downloads actually had a dip in 2016. Now, we don't have a, 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 a perfect answer for it, but you know, 16 is also when the, the Robinhood investors started came into being and they are downloading a lot. So despite the fact that machine downloads actually increased in absolute magnitude, but the relative percentage we experienced a dip. But when we look at the first six months of 2017, we have partial data, the percentage pretty much uh, went back. So we are talking about in recent years, about 85% of the downloads of the corporate disclosures from the SEC's website, which is called Adagor, are probably machine related. So that, that's, that is the, the ballpark, okay? Now, then you will say, okay, does the machine downloads actually related to AI, okay? So there is institutional investor talking about how hedge funds increasingly uh, become AI powered and those with AI capacity are actually outperform their peers, okay? So we also uh, look at identify AI hedge funds by looking at the LinkedIn credentials. So, so basically, if people reveal uh, from their LinkedIn page, they're affiliated with hedge funds and the list on the resume with AI credentials will aggregate a hedge fund level. That's how we identify those hedge funds with, with big. Uh, big AI capacity. And indeed, we find that the AI hedge fund ownership is significantly positively correlated with machine downloads. So machine downloads indeed are measuring something related to, uh, to AI, uh, AI readership, at least from, from the hedge fund perspective. Now, it's always when you have such a, a, a large data set, it's always just to, to print out like a screen print to show like, does it really, really map to what we have, have uh, in mind? Now, if we look at all the um, asset managers that ever filed a, a quarter end portfolio filing called Form 13F with the SEC, that unit set, uh, we'll see like who are the highest, who, ha who have the highest machine downloads. Now, bingo, the two rows uh, rise to the top of the list are Renaissance Technology and Two Sigma. They're both very, very prominent quant driven hedge funds. And, and so is yes, among top 10, including 0.72, Citadel, d Shaw, they're all among the best known uh, quant funds. And if you look at the top 20, uh, they're invariably either quant hedge funds or, or, or comprehensive investment banks with significant asset management business and nothing really, really surprises. So basically, you know, the IT address that downloads those firms in massive quantity are indeed linked to the usual suspects we would have at margin. Okay, so when we, after I explain how we measure machine readership, now we switch gear to what the firm would do. Now, when the machines are potentially reading the corporate filings, then the corporation should have incentive to make their machine more, uh, make their filing more machine readable. Now, how do we me measure machine readability? Again, there is a, a very well-developed literature on measuring uh, the extent to which the textual, not just quantitative, but the textual information could be processed, parsed, and automated by algorithmic, al al algorithmic programs. So I just list some examples. For example, how easy it is to separate tables from the text, how easy it is to extract numbers from the text or in the given cell of the table, okay? Whether the information is self-contained, without going to external exhibits. You know, if you ever do textual processing, you know, whenever you have to go to the ex external exhibits is always a pain. So when we look at the principal component of all these elements, we have an index of machine readability. So you will see that in the series time series plot. Okay, so this is standardized statistic doesn't really have meaning. So the average is zero. Okay, you see how they involve over time. So you see all the way to financial crisis, the machine readability improved a lot. And during the financial crisis stagnated, probably people are better, more serious things to worry about. Then the progress resume again, but currently we are kind of in a saturation. So it's not like people don't wish to progress further, but I think we're waiting for the next wave of technology to bring us to a new level of textual, um, textual processing. Now, when we link the two together, um, we discover the, our, our main finding is that if we look at all the, all the annual and quarterly findings by all the publicly listed firms in the US, we find that if a, a, a company is chased by the machine downloads in the recent past, then the current filings are more likely to have high machine readable quality. 
Okay, so you can see like if you put in the statistic terms, one standard deviation increase in machine downloads is a one quarter standard deviation in the machine readability. That's quite a sensitive response. And also you can argue whether this level could be stagnant, is a level capturing action. We're also looking at a periodical machine readability upgrades, meaning a discrete increase in machine readability. And we also find that is associated with the recent cost increase in the machine downloads. Okay, now how does this affect trading? Okay, so here we are finding a, a intriguing result is basically, you know, machine are creating new information asymmetry based on public information. The finance literature always talk about this information gap between insiders and outsiders, but we are finding this uh, information gap among the outsiders, okay? So when among the firms with high machine downloads, we find out that once the filing is deposited on SEC website, those stocks would incur a trade, the first trade after the disclosure about seven to 12 seconds faster, okay? Or 10 to 15 seconds faster if you classify the trade into directional trade, meaning trading in the right direction, okay? And the above effect is even stronger when you interact machine downloads with machine readability, okay? So you can understand if you were a market maker, Okay, and you are going, you, you anticipate a lot of trades actually motivated by, by, by with the AI and the machine help, and you need to protect yourself with a higher bid ask spread. Indeed, that's what we find. So when a, the, the machine downloads, if you increase by one standard deviation, then we will find the bid ask spread right after the filing would increase by five to seven basis points compared to those firms with um, moderate, uh, with moderate levels of machine downloads. Okay, now the next second part, I think it's a, it is more interesting. It's not just about machine readability in terms of formatting and easy processing, but how do you really communicate the content? Now, I always use the following paragraph to my students who will do, do uh, textual processing. I say, you know, if your, student, if your Python program can understand what President George Washington was saying, then you made it, okay? So this farewell speech, if with a human eye, we know that President Washington was saying, you know, he's not running for the third time. But if you gave to a Python program, the computer got awfully confused and doesn't know what's, what's, what, what, what the president intended to say. So this is an example how you will write differently to human readers versus machine readers. Now, the next quoted sentence was actually from an annual report called a concern about possible delays unwarranted. It is meant to relax a human mind when you read it, you're supposed to be relaxed. But when a machine reads it, get triple triggered because you have three negative words, which is concern, delay, and unwarranted. You even feel not sure about yourself with the uncertain word possible. So the machine will interpret as this very, very bad news, okay? So I hope, you know, whoever who, who are, uh, who are, who are in, in the audience would remember, you know, when we submit our resumes to a potential employer, uh, today's world most likely a resume will be read by machine. And we also have to bear this in mind, how we will write our resume for the machine to get a positive signal about us, okay? So we run into this, uh, uh, this, uh, this time, uh, this event study. So in 2011, two academics uh, named Lockhart McDonald, they published a seminal paper. They gave a very special list about positive neck towards in the financial context. Now, before that, we have a Harvard dictionary that always have positive neck towards. Now, that dictionary doesn't quite work with the finance context because the word liability that appears in every single financial statement is considered neck to word by the Harvard dictionary. Okay, so Lockhart McDonald's picked it up. And, and fix it and publish a new dictionary. And that new dictionary will instantly fed into many, many algorithm trading, at least at the first few to a step, not necessarily lead to final trading recommendations, but it's widely used as a first level um, uh, screening. So what we find is the following, okay? So remember 2011, the magic year was the publication of Rock from McDonald's, okay? And the blue line and red line are representing the firms with top Tursa machine downloads with the bottom Tursa, okay? Now you will see the using of the law from McDonald negative word was neck to neck all the way to 2011, but then they diverge. 
basically firms with a lot of machine downloads avoiding using that towards and the ones that with with low machine downloads keep keep on okay so so if you you know if you say like what are the words are they avoiding again so the left panel are the words they avoiding absolute frequency and the right panel shows the words of re re reduction in the highest relative frequency so words like restructuring, termination, restatement, correction, destroy, those things have been avoided after the 2011 publication of the Lockham McDonald paper. Okay, now the last, last test I'm, I'm, I'm going into is the real talk, right? Right now I'm saying how to talk when a machine is listening. Now so far I've been talking about how to write when a machine is reading, but now we get to the talk, okay? Now around 20, 2008, there's, there's a, it's a, a software called LVA that gained a lot of popularity. So investors always looking for new ways to gain an edge information process. If you can have the software to read a CEO voice, you can detect a small trembling that signal the lack of confidence when a human ears might miss, okay? And traders trade off some in, such information, at least in early waves seem to be earning some extra profit, okay? So would that affect how the managers talk, right? So if you know that LVA is listening to your voice, try to detect confidence, passion, clarity, then you would probably train your voice to that software to appear what the investors want to get, okay? So we are using this software to measure the two measures from the psych psychology literature. One is called a valence, this is called arousal. So valence is a spectrum about how positive you feel, so positivity, okay? Arousal is the, is the measurement of how excited or you're passionate you feel about your firm, okay? So I have two colleagues who show that if you're an entrepreneur, you should train your voice to have high balance and high arousal, you're more likely to get funding from the VC, okay? Now we are using to, to measure the CEO emotion quality of their speech and see whether they are reacting to the extent of machine readership. Now, very, very interestingly, we find that indeed managers talk with higher valence and to a less degree high arousal when there are more machines expected in the audience. And it's important that we only look at earnings conference calls because a manager could be very positive, very excited because earnings are good. So we are controlling for the extra firm fundamentals. So we're controlling for earnings or earnings surprise. And just say facing the same or comparable fundamentals, when there are more machines in the audience, the CEO will talk with more measured balance and to some degree, a little bit higher arousal. So we also find that for CEOs, Sounding positive is very, very important, just as important as if you're an entrepreneur. But feeling excited for your company is less important than if you're an entrepreneur. So if you're an entrepreneur, you have to be very passionate, but the CEO, you can be a little bit calm, but you have to be absolutely positive, okay? Okay, so you know, I, I was given 20 minutes and, and just taking up the 20, 20 minute time. So I hope you, know, you find it interesting that AI changes everything, right? But in, in fact, the way we write, when we speak has also been reshaped by machine readership because we have a stake in, in, in the perception of what we say or what we write, okay? So we observe that firms become, uh, prepare filings more friendly to machine processing and the processing, not only about the formatting, but they also adapt the sentiment to tone management to the evolving algorithms, okay? So we call it a feedback effect. When you think about feedback effect, you can think about the cat and mouse game. It will never end. The cat figure out the mouse strategy, mouse figure out the cat strategy, and they will have this game forever. But I think it's a fascinating uh, phenomenon in order us to find, understand that the behavior by AI will feed back in financial market, the feedback into our algorithm, and it will keep involving with the development of the market. So look forward to your questions and thanks to be thanks to be here. So if anybody would like to pose a question or comment thoughts, let's see what comes up in the Q and A. Okay, Wei, I'm going to let you read that one. Okay, so uh, this 
this is a uh, a um, a um, terminology in in the psychology. So basically, uh, speech is measured in the two dimensional. One is from very negative to very positive. That's called a valence, and the other is from a very loose and positive, a passive to being very excited and passionate. So that name is called arousal. So basically. The high indicator will say the CEO talk with such excitement and passion about either the project of the firm or prospect of the firm. Okay, we have a second question uh, from Lori Shahone. Do humans interpret what the AI comes up with? And what do you know about the human interpretation? Yeah, so basically, you know, the AI sometimes also try to approximate the human feelings about, you know, reading or listening, right? So we try to find the human, we don't think the human beings' feelings or interpretation will change dramatically when an algorithm becomes available. So if after a certain um, a list of publishing, a certain list of positive and negative words are published and feed into the uh, the, the algorithm, if we observe the firm suddenly reduce using those words, it's not because they're adapting to, to human beings, because human beings really haven't evolved in that one year, but it's more likely they're, they're responding to, uh, to how the machine is processing. So in a new version of the paper, we also look at a similar change after the Google BERT, the BIT, so the BERT algorithm became available, and we also show that the BERT measure of negativity would drop among the firms that with high machine downloads. We have a question from a colleague. Yeah. <laughs> would you like oh, me to yes, read it? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, so this, this the feedback effect is basically the equilibrium will be the ever evolving because if the CEOs or job candidates knowing that they're they're interviewed, assessed by the machine, they would they would you know train. Uh, train themselves to look more favorable. And that technique would be obsolete very quickly because it would the, the, the level of informativeness would just drop. So meaning the manipulation go, go into the train sample. So the new algorithm will be robust to that manipulation. But the new manipulation will become because the new manipulation has to be not to be the training sample to outsmart the machine. But when you try to outsmart the machine, the new data will get into the training sample and the AI will pick it up. So it's just like many, many other um, activities in the financial marketing always want to get a little bit edge, a little bit ahead of everybody else. But eventually, it will be part of the equilibrium. And a question from Jillian Ward, um, just does this include computer vision or facial expression um, sentiment analysis as well? Oh, that, that's a very, very good question. So currently we only use the audio part, but I understand there's also a, uh, a, a, a software that do the facial expression and, and we're very, very happy we will extend our research into, into, into that part. But currently we only do the audio. And we have a question from Swayam Thacker. Do you find machine readability to cause machine downloads or do you find machine downloads to cause and improve machine readability? Where's the direction of causality? Yes, so this is a very, very challenging question. So currently we are measuring machine downloads at the lag and to measure like the current machine readability responding to the past machine downloads. But in our full draft paper, we have some event study uh, that basically show the, the hedge fund, the AI equipped hedge funds, when they change their ownership, will change the shareholder composition of the firms, and then we will see the firm changing their strategy subsequently. So that's kind of the intuition behind how we will tease out the causal, uh, causal inference. Yeah, so the next question is also very, very good. So when human beings interpret signals, human beings tend to have very diverse opinions. So you know, we, we can look at the same thing, have very different opinions. But the machines are much more homogeneous because there are several uh, dominant algorithms, you know, notably by Google at all, and, and, and people would develop on, on their basic level of software with some, some tweaks and, and some variation, but there's a lot of homogeneity. 
So we do have a, a, a follow-up paper uh, hope to you know, present in a future time that show when the signals are processed by machines that tend to reach the common inferences, what will be the implication for, for the stock pricing as well, the market evolution. So that will be, that will be a, 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 a separate, uh, separate question. Yes, so basically the last question uh, from Jingjing that showed that we are using the same criteria for all the sample, all the sample years. So basically the recent year stagnated, not quite going down, but literally like stagnated, is because the current, we are reaching an absorbing state. The current technology is capable of making all those filings machine possible. It's just a matter of some firms upgrade early, some firms upgrade late. And by late 20, 2010s, basically all the firms upgraded. So now we reach a absorbing state, but this equilibrium will change. We're waiting for the new wave of technology come and suddenly we'll have another staggered wave of, of upgrading and we'll see the curve to go up again. But indeed we're using the uniform criteria. So I think that concludes our questions. Very, very interesting topic way. Uh, fascinating, actually. And, um, and great questions from the audience. Thank you. So I would like to then uh, switch over to Laura and we'll start her segment. Thank you. Yeah. Looks good. Looks great. Great, so this is the about the changing economics of knowledge production, and this is joint research with my colleague here at Columbia, Simona Abbeys. So we want to ask a, a few related questions. A big one on many people's mind is how valuable is data? And a lot of the companies today are uh, the biggest companies in the U.S. stock market are valued primarily because of their data, right? We all know Google has a beautiful building, but that's not really the foundation of its, you know, enormous valuation. We value it because of what it knows. And this value has been exploding recently. So one of the things we want to get a grip on is, is why is this increasing? And, and how might we actually ask, you know, what is the true value of all this data? And a key feature of new data technologies has something to do with this. So they're changing the relative intensity of labor and data. So we're going to draw a parallel between the kind of AI technologies that Wei has been talking about and something like the Industrial Revolution. You think about what the Industrial Revolution did a century ago is it allowed us to produce goods with a lot more machinery and fewer workers, right? We still employed a lot of people, but the number of machines, the number of units of capital per worker went way up and that allowed us to produce a lot more efficiently. Well, AI is doing something similar to knowledge production. We'll, we'll find that workers are working with much more data over time and per worker. And that's making them more efficient and able to produce more knowledge. And this change in the composition of data and labor is really important because it matters for data value. It matters for questions about inequality, like the labor income share of all the profits in the economy. And it matters for the optimal firm size and, and what we're likely to see in terms of competition, both in the financial sector and the real economy going forward. So we wanna think about how is AI changing the production of knowledge? And we're gonna, in principle, we could do that in any sector of the economy, but we wanna look at investment management. It's a really good laboratory for asking this question because it's primarily a knowledge industry. So what we have in mind as a production process is that there's something out there that we'll call raw or unstructured data. And then it needs to go through a processing, which means cleaning that data, structuring it, warehousing it, putting it in a form that's queryable so that somebody could put it to a productive purpose. So they're producing, they are people whose job this is, and we'll see this in hiring data, that there are lots of people being hired to do this job and they're turning raw and unstructured data into structured data. And then there's a separate group of people who take that structured data and do something we'll call analysis. So they're gonna produce knowledge or re actionable recommendations out of that structured data. So you could think of that as you know, using machine learning or building a model or producing some forecast. And so we'll think of two different ways that analysis might take place. One is by using an old technology and the other is by using a new technology. So the old technology might be something like using Excel or Stata or something like that. 
And a new technology would be using AI, machine learning, or a suite of big data technologies whose key feature is they need a lot of data to produce accurate predictions. So I'm gonna show you a very brief model. There'll be a little bit of mathematics that's essential because I have to tell you what it is we're estimating, and then I'll tell you what we find. So here's the model on one slide. Knowledge can be produced using either the old technology or the big data technology. I'll call it AI for short, but I really mean broader than just artificial intelligence, strictly speaking. And the same kind of data can be used for both. And these technologies have different rates of diminishing returns. So what does this say? The knowledge you can produce with AI depends on a productivity parameter that's time varying, and it depends on a productivity piece that's firm specific. So some firms are just more productive than others, and we get better at producing knowledge over time. We learn more stuff. But it depends on data, that's the D, and labor. And this is labor that's skilled in using AI. It's different from the labor down here in the lowercase l that won't be skilled in using AI, that'll be old technology skilled. And these exponents on the D and L tell you something about the curvature. So if alpha is close to one, then doubling data approximately doubles knowledge. If alpha is really small, then doubling data increases knowledge, but by less and less and less as we get more and more data. So alpha tells us how much diminishing returns there are to data, or it, it's the opposite. High alpha would tell us there's very little in diminishing returns. And we'll find the same form, we'll estimate the same form for the old technology, but with a different exponent. So what would be a big revolution, like a big industrial revolution in knowledge production, it would be a much bigger alpha relative to gamma. That would tell us the data has a lot less diminishing returns when we pair it with AI relative to the old technology, where if I try to load 20 data series into Excel, okay, maybe I can work with that. If I try to load a thousand or a million data series into Excel, I'm gonna crash it. It's not useful, I gotta pick and choose. And so those last few data series have very low marginal value. So the data inputs we're thinking about in this production process are not raw data. This D is not its raw data. It's the structured, clean to machine readable data that gets paired with labor to produce knowledge. But producing that structured data also requires labor, a different form of labor. These will be our data warehousers and data cleaners. And we'll call that kind of labor lambda. It also has some diminishing marginal returns. So new structured data is added to the existing stock of structured data, but data also depreciates, right? Old data isn't as relevant, it isn't as valuable as newer data. So here's our old data from period T. It depreciates at rate delta. We're gonna add new structured data that these data manager workers produce, and that gives us our data stock in the following period. Okay, so that's the model that we wanna estimate, and the key questions are what are this alpha and what are this gamma? How much does the returns to data diminish with the old and the new technology? So the key assumptions here are that firms maximize the value of their firm. So they're gonna equate the marginal benefit of a worker with the marginal cost of a worker. The marginal cost of a worker is the wage that you pay that worker. And so this assumption that firms are doing something that's roughly optimal will give us some optimality conditions that'll allow us to use wage and hiring data to identify these key parameters of interest, which is how much does an additional unit of data, a marginal unit of data contribute to knowledge, even though we can't observe the data, right? So macroeconomists estimate production functions like the ones I showed you with capital and labor all the time, but they have a much easier time because not only can they count labor, they can go measure capital. Here, we don't know how much data a firm has, so we've got to impute it. And we're gonna do that by looking at hiring and wages. So essentially what we're asking is what amount of data and what production process, what alpha and gamma rationalize a firm hiring this many data managers and this many analysts of each type and paying them the wages that we observe in each year. Okay, so that's the objective. That's how we're going about this. So how do we do it? Well, we look at labor at job postings. So our job posting sample comes from Burning Glass Technologies. It's, uh, we're looking at data between 2010 and 2018, which is when we started on the project. We identify workers in data management. Those are the people who are taking raw data and turning into structured data. People who have AI skills and people who have old technology skills. And we're doing that by developing dictionaries of words and using them uh, using natural language processing on the full text of the job postings. 
So here in these, in these pictograms, you can see some samples of the kinds of words that identify each kind of job. So on the right, we have our data managers. They're the people who warehouse and clean data. And you can see the kind of words associated with those jobs are things like data model, data manage, data quality, SQL servers, and so forth. And here you see the two different kinds of data analysts. So our AI workers have words like machine learn, data scientist, um, quant research, uh, mathematic, and so forth. And our old technology words have some words in common because they are performing a similar task, right? Portfolio manage is in both of these, for example, but they have different frequencies and those words get different weights. So these old technology workers are more like statisticians, mathematicians doing financial modeling and they have different software associated with them. So when we count up these jobs, here are the raw counts of jobs that we see. We find that this top line is the data management workers. Those are the people who are cleaning the data. They're actually the most common types of hires in this sample. There are armies of these people being hired by investment firms in the financial sector to clean and warehouse their data. And then we see old technology workers. They're still much, much more common in this industry. What we see is that the AI workers are still a relatively small fraction of the workforce. This right panel is the same blue line I show in here. I'm just zooming in because when compared to these other workforces, the AI workforce looks pretty small and trivial, but, but you can see it's exploding, particularly around 2015, 2016, which is about the, the period of time in which deep learning became more viable. When a computer could tell that a picture of a cat was really a cat, that's about the time when uh, we see hiring in the financial sector of AI workers really pick up. So AI employment rose 13 times from the period 2015 to 2018. We adjust for job separation rates and we recognize that not every job posting results in a filled job. Remember, we don't observe firms data stocks, but if we know how many people are being hired to warehouse and clean the data, and we know what they're paid, we can infer something about their productivity, we can make inference about what the data stock of this firm would have to be to make it worthwhile to hire this many people to manage to maintain that data. So our sample contains 3,008 plus uh, uh, job postings and 33,000 and some employer months for 812 unique companies. So here's what the salary data looks like. Uh, the salary data comes from a different source. There's some salary data from burning glass, but it's, it's not comprehensive and it's a bit selected. So our salary uh, information that we use comes from Payscale. That's a crowdsourced uh, platform where they ask people how much they earn in various sectors and then give them recommendations about what the market wage might be or what kind of skills they might acquire to boost their wage. And what we find is that our AI skilled workers, their salary distinguishes them from their old technology peers. They earn $26,000 more per year on average than the workers who don't have these skills. And the data managers earn a little bit less than the old technology workers. So this is gonna inform us about the productivity of firms because if a worker is more productive, a firm is gonna to have to compete for them more intensively and pay them more. Okay, so that's our data and that's our measurement strategy. What do we find? We find that that exponent on data for artificial, for the new technology, the big data technologies is significantly higher than that exponent for the old technologies. And what does that tell us? That tells us that with the old technology, data had more diminishing returns. Getting more additional, more and more additional data added less and less to the stock of knowledge relative to the new big data technologies. So big data makes more data have more marginal value. It increases the value of data. And this increase is significant. It's about 5%, um, you know, compared to estimates of the Industrial Revolution, which said that the rate of diminishing returns on capital changed from at the lower end about 5%, at the upper end about 12%. This puts this at the lower end of the estimates for the size of the Industrial Revolution, right? So our big data revolution is maybe of the order of magnitude of the Industrial Revolution, maybe about half that, depending on which economic historian you looked at. This also implies that the owners of data should earn a larger slice of the pie. So these same exponents that tell us about diminishing returns also tell us about what should be the fraction of income of the firm, the fraction of revenue of the firm paid to data owners rather than labor owners. And so one of the things this technology is doing 
is it's ensuring that data grabs a larger slice of the value pie and workers a smaller fraction. So the labor share of income here is falling from 18 to 13%. So here's what we find in terms of the value of the data, it's exploding. So when we take our estimates of these parameters, we put them back into our production function and we say, what is the value of this firm with its data or without its data? Here's the resulting value of data. It rose 25% in four years. So why is this increase in data, this large rapid increase in the value of data happening? Well, first, firms are just accumulating more data. We can see that in their hiring and that larger data stock has larger value. The more quantity, more value. But second, there are more analysis workers being hired, right? They may be a smaller fraction of the overall production of knowledge, but there being more workers makes each data point more valuable. And third, firms are becoming more productive at using data. And increase, interestingly, the old technology workers are becoming more productive and the AI workers are becoming more productive. The AI workers are becoming relatively more productive. They started at a much lower level. They're learning much more rapidly than the old technology workers. Their productivity is increasing many fold over this period, but they're also not yet at the level of productivity of old workers. That suggests that what firms are doing is kind of dabbling in these big data technologies, learning how to use them, getting better and better at them, but not quite at the level of their regular bread and butter ends. Okay, so what do we learn from all of this? The first thing is data is really tough to measure, right? We can't go in with a ruler and say, how big is your stack of data and how big is their stack of data and who's got more stuff saved on their server? Data can be more relevant, it can be less relevant, it can be more valuable and so forth. But the clue here, we're sort of following this you know, trail of breadcrumbs to try to piece together how much data do firms have. And the key clue was our data management hiring. If I can see how many workers you're hiring to maintain your data set, I have a pretty good idea of how much data you have and what its value is. So we find that not only is there more, da more data over time, but the data firms have is creating more value. And it's because when it's paired with productive technologies like AI, firms are able to squeeze more profits out of it. And the magnitude of this technological change looks something like the Industrial Revolution, maybe on the lower end of those estimates, but similar in magnitude, but for knowledge production, a different kind of production process. And finally, the change in diminishing returns, this parameter I'm estimating, it's not just of mathematical interest, it matters for the value of data as an asset, it matters for income inequality of owners of data versus workers, and it matters for how big the firms should be getting and how much competition there will, should be in financial markets going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. That was, again, a really interesting and different topic. Um, I've learned a lot this evening and I'm gonna just take a moment and let everybody think about any questions they may have. You're welcome to write in the Q&A. I'm not seeing anything come through. I don't know, it might be dinner time. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long day for many people. I, I know. But again, this was a great evening and uh, such a great learning opportunity to have access to our faculty um, in an evening format. And hopefully soon we can start doing these in person as well. So I'd like to say thank you very much to both of our star faculty members uh, in our finance department for spending and sharing their time with us tonight. And, oh, I think we have a question. And also, uh, nope. And also thank you to everyone who spent their time with us tonight in, in the audience and our attendees. So we look forward to staying in touch and uh, our next free, no free lunch. It's not a no free lunch seminar anymore, it's called Facu CBS Faculty Talks. Our next CBS Faculty Talks seminar will be taking place in April uh, and mid-April, and I will send out an email closer to the date. Oh, uh, okay, a question. The 
we don't mind hanging on a minute, let's see if, if a question comes through. You can go ahead and write it in the chat, Maggie, if, if that's if you can access it. Okay. Let me see here. Hold on. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna, we're hanging on here, Maggie, and I'm so sorry. Oh, here we go. Okay. So okay. you want to read the question? Sure. Um, the question is, how do you see value of labor, the value of labor as AI and data take on a larger share of the value? Right. So um, the value of, of labor as a fraction of the total value the firms are producing seems to be getting smaller. And that's that, you know, that's that's something that that we're that we can tease out of this data by seeing the hiring and, and the wages and inferring the productivity. But that doesn't mean that any given worker is paid less. Um, in fact, as we switch to more AI workers, we may see wages go up. It's just that the whole amount of value, the whole pie of the this you know financial management industry is increasing. So even a smaller slice of the pie if the pie is bigger, might still be a bigger slice than what you got before. So that's that's kind of the, the message is that workers are not losing out relative to what they had before. There's still more payments, wages are going up and there's more hiring. So payments to workers in total are going up, but the size of the pie is increasing at a faster rate. So they're getting a smaller slice of it. Thank you. Great question. Okay. Well, we'll wrap up the evening. Thanks again, everybody. And have a good evening.